Hi everyone, this is the inaugural video I am putting together for my YouTube channel, thanks to a lot of nudging and prodding from A.A. Ron Smith Levin and Mark Headley, uh, who've both been assisting me greatly on getting my act together to get some actual videos on the site. I thought I would start today with one about a topic that is very near and dear both to me and everybody who has an interest in the world of Scientology, uh, and something that I covered on my blog today, that is the order from the court in the Gawain and Laura Baxter and Valeska Paris lawsuit in Tampa that orders that David Miscavige has been served in that case and that he has 21 days in which to respond now to the complaint. I put up a number of, of comments about this and I just wanted to go through a few of them. Uh, Aaron covered a lot of this yesterday on his, on his YouTube channel. Uh, and I have some sort of perspective on these things having been involved in this sort of litigation and these sort of issues with respect to David Miscavige particularly before. Um, first of all, the magistrate judge issued the order based on the hearing briefing that she had received. Um, I expect that Miscavige's lawyers will seek to ask the judge to review and overturn her decision. Uh, that's likely the first step that they will take. Um, it's very unlikely to be successful. Uh, judges don't tend to overturn the, the rulings of their magistrates. And she has done a pretty careful job of going through all of the law and all of the evidence that has been presented and laid out a very clear and detailed ruling about why she reached the decision that Miscavige has been served. Even though there is little chance of success on, on seeking to appeal something like this, that doesn't mean that Scientology won't do it. The, the strategy that Scientology employs is the strategy laid out by L. Ron Hubbard for dealing with civil litigation, which is to cost the plaintiffs more time and money than they can afford, eventually run them out of money, time, patience, or their willingness to continue a battle that Scientology is able to invest almost unlimited funds into to hire an almost unlimited number of lawyers to make life difficult for plaintiffs. I will say that the lawyers that are representing the Baxters and Valeska have done a wonderful job of not only doing all the necessary steps that are required, which is pretty lengthy and arduous, they have followed the letter of the law, been exceedingly diligent in what they've done, and laid it all out carefully and concisely and precisely. And I think that the judge or the magistrate judge recognized that this was something that was basically inevitable. Some of the things that the magistrate judge found are going to cause a lot of angst in the, the world of Mr. Miskovich. She has found that though Miscavige and his lawyers have tried to claim that, the, that various things were not alleged, that in fact that they were. And this, this will take on uh, great significance should this case go forward because allegations in a complaint are, are things that are really important, how the complaint is framed and, it, and if you do it properly and you lay out what your case is exactly, then the defendants can't just come in and say, oh, look, they never even made a proper claim. They never, so this case should just be dismissed. 
And that is what Miscavige would be hoping for, ultimately, will be to get this case dismissed. A few of the things that, that she found are pretty interesting. She said, Miscavige is alleged to be the leader of the Church of Scientology, the chairman of the board of defendant RTC, and the head of Scientology's Sea Org, quote, an unincorporated association of individuals, close quote, whose members staff and manage the organizational defendants and all Scientology-related entities. Miscavige is effectively the senior most officer of all of them, regardless of whether he is listed as an officer or director in their corporate filings. This is really important. And the fact that she pulled this out of the pleadings and the complaint and ma is making a point of this is is not something that, that we have seen in many court cases previously. Scientology has played, you know, loose with the facts and worms its way around what the C organization is when anybody who's ever been in the C organization knows that the C organization basically is the control organization of Scientology and that you nothing happens that is outside the control of Scientology and that the hierarchy of the C organization is a hierarchy that really controls everything that happens in Scientology. And the head honcho of the C organization is without doubt Captain David Miscavige. And Captain David Miscavige takes great offense to being called Captain David Miscavige, even though he has promotional or used to have promotional pictures of him and videos from events with him wearing his four-stripe captain outfit and being addressed as Captain David Miscavige. But when that became a liability or a potential liability in litigation, he started objecting. Uh, I remember in the Rathman case in Texas, he claimed that when the lawyers for Monique Rathbun referred to him as Captain Miscavige, that this was somehow a, a slur or a, an insult that, that was being hurled his way. It, it was pretty ridiculous. There is also another court case that um, I've referred to on my blog a number of times, and it was the CST tax exemption case, CST, the IRS commissioner, um, where they, that court, found that the real control of Scientology exists through the C organization. And this is another uh, reference to that, which is going to be very important as this case goes forward. Of course, there is the question of whether the case will go forward, because still pending in front of Judge Barber, the actual federal judge in this case, is whether Scientology can force the Baxters and Valeska to go to their so-called religious arbitration. Uh, that, re quote, religious arbitration is, as the dissenting justice in the 11th Circuit decision in the Garcia case said, uh, actually, not arbitration, just arbitrary. And they just make up their rules as they go along, but we'll leave that for another day. Another thing that, that the magistrate judge picked out was the fact that the IAS, Scientology tries to claim that they don't really do anything, they're just a membership organization, uh, blah, you know, that sort of tone of, oh, there's nothing to see here, judge, the IAS is, is completely guiltless and blameless in all things. And she says, among other things, IASA collects membership dues and, quote, administers and transfers those funds and other payments solicited by IAS under the exclusive direction of Defendant Miscavige for his personal enrichment and benefit and for the benefit of the organizational defendants as well as the free winds and other Scientology-affiliated entities, organizations, properties, and enterprises. Now, that is a quote from the plaintiffs. So Scientology will still dispute that. But she is clearly saying there 
is not a problem with having alleged these things in the complaint. And that is what is significant about these. Perhaps the most telling thing in this order is the fact that the judge says all of these people are saying they don't know where Miscavige is, they don't know how to find him, there is these efforts that have been made to serve him, and that the plaintiffs are just at fault because they never showed up at the right place at the right time. Tough luck even though they've made numerous efforts to serve him in this case. The magistrate judge says, while Miscavige repeatedly asserts that plaintiffs have attempted to effectuate service at the wrong address or addresses at which he was not present, Miscavige has never provided plaintiffs or the court with the correct address. And then she puts a footnote. At the hearing, Miscavige's counsel informed the court that he was not authorized to accept service on Miscavige's behalf and only that he was, quote, happy to have discussions, unquote, with plaintiff's counsel as to the correct address to effectuate service. However, following the hearing, plaintiffs filed a supplemental declaration of compliance stating that Miscavige's counsel has refused to both accept service on Miscavige's behalf or to provide plaintiffs with an address at which Miscavige could be served, despite plaintiffs' offering of safeguards to address Miscavige's security concerns. Clearly, the magistrate judge was not impressed with the way that Miscavige and his lawyers have tried to hide his whereabouts and location, and even refuse to provide any information to the court about where he is. The game playing has resulted in the magistrate judge feeling that they're playing games with the court too, not just with the plaintiff's lawyers. That does not portend well for what's going to happen in the future. There have been a number of cases where, federal cases, uh, where Scientology has messed around with service of process, discovery, turning over documents, etc., etc. And in federal court, a number of them have been referred, as many judges do, those sort of issues to magistrate judges. And there is a pretty famous ruling from uh, Magistrate Judge Colts in Los Angeles. And I think the RTC was fined $2.9 million in that case for messing around with the court and the legal system. And here they are starting this case out with the same sort of uh, flavor being imparted to the court about how they go about litigating. Okay, she also says that Miscavige argues that the amended complaint fails to contain sufficient allegations that he individually engaged in business in Florida for his personal pecuniary benefit. The court disagrees. And then she lays out, here is what the defendant, uh, what the plaintiffs have claimed about Miscavige's involvement. The magistrate judge then says in a footnote that Miscavige argues in a single sentence without citation to authority that, quote, a religious organization collecting membership fees does not amount to, quote, business activity, unquote. She then says you can't just say things like that and in that way without any citation to law, but nevertheless, plaintiffs allege that the dues are collected under the exclusive direction of defendant Miscavige for his personal enrichment, including financing his war chest, a discretionary fund Miscavige and other defendants, most senior officers, utilized to support intelligence gathering and retaliation campaigns against defectors and critics of defendants. Now, that is exactly what happens and exactly right. And this in uh, an order like this and that sort of language being repeated and, and agreed to by the judge and disagreeing with the arguments made by Miscavige 
is definitely not something that, that they want and probably is another reason why this is going to be appealed because Miscavige is going to be really upset about a bunch of the language that is in this order, including the fact that she talks about the declarations that were filed by Warren McShane, the president of RTC, and Sarah Heller, the legal officer from OSA Flag, both of which sought to walk this crazy line between saying that Miscavige doesn't have any involvement in anything anywhere ever and not having a public record that says that because Miscavige pretends to, or not pretends, Miscavige tells Scientologists that he is involved in everything and they should all be thankful for everything that he does for them because he's everywhere all the time doing it all. And you don't see quote, Scientology success stories anymore that don't thank COB for making the tech available, for making it possible for me to go up the bridge, for making this, for making that. Like, he is, in the eyes of Scientology, all-seeing, all-knowing, and all-powerful, and yet these declarants had to try and say, well, he doesn't really, he's not really anywhere. He doesn't really know anything. He doesn't really have anything to do. And she says, quote, the third party declarations that Miscavige has provided also do not refute the extent to which he controls and directs the organizational defendant's business in Florida for his personal pecuniary benefit. Rather, the declarations only refute that he has a permanent office in Florida or that any of the Florida addresses are his, quote, primary place of business, unquote. So she saw right through those declarations. This was not a good day in the world of Mr. Mickey Witz. I remember in December of 1999, a similar circumstance where David Miscavige had been named as a defendant in the Lisa McPherson civil case, and there was a hearing in front of the judge in Tampa about whether he would allow Miscavige to be dismissed from that case. Uh, when he was not dismissed, Miscavige basically had a meltdown. And I imagine that those people around Miscavige, Warren McShane and Sarah Heller and whoever else, had a very bad day yesterday. And probably it's not getting any better today and it probably won't get any better in the next couple of weeks. This is certainly not the end of this litigation, or even though it's a very significant thing for the plaintiffs to have accomplished this because most have failed or given up or not been able to do it, it is a tiny first step in a very long road that is going to be happening with this litigation. Anyway, I, I wanted to keep this short. This is a sort of an experiment. Aaron is helping me put this together so that I can get it onto this channel and there is some content there that is new for you to be able to look at. I also want to mention that um, as we talked about in the, the Mondays with Mark and Mike, the SP shop is no longer going to be providing signed autograph copies of my book they are now going to be made available through me directly so because it's just, it was just getting too much. In any event, shortly on my blog, there will be a new button that you can order a signed copy of my book if you still want it and haven't been able to get it through the SP shop. Um, I am adding a little innovation because I'm going to be doing this personally now you can ask me to write a particular message in the front of the book or a, a name that you would like, whatever you want, you can just put it on there. And if that feature isn't up on the blog by the time this video goes live, it probably will be in the very near future. Thank you so much for listening. This is my first uh, maybe fumbly effort at this. Uh, I hope to be coming with more content. I appreciate everybody who supports 
the work of the Aftermath Foundation, who supports Aaron's YouTube channel, who supports Mark's YouTube channel, who comes to my blog, who make kind comments on Twitter and come to our support. You are all so incredibly valuable, important, and appreciated. See you again soon. Bye now.